Hello, I'm the Angry Spork. Last week we looked at one of the first comics I ever owned, Savage Dragon No. 2, and while save for some ongoing plot threads, his adventure with the shell-backed Clan Hamato seemed to be wrapped up fairly neatly. But what I only recently discovered is that this story about green superheroes fighting living stone monsters continued in a more formal one-shot, this time not from Image, but Mirage Comics. I'm taking issue with Savage Dragon slash Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, so let's see if this comic makes us want to turn the page or turn our heads. The cover is much more action-packed, the dragon charging forward, unloading his sidearm on some unseen threat, while the brothers back him up. Teenage deputized Ninja Turtles, turn in your badge and weapons, you're suspended. While Eric Larson assisted on the story, it's written by Michael Dooney, the latter of whom has a letter of appreciation for this gig, and the art is done by Dooney, Robert Jones, and Eric Vincent. Enter the Savage Dragon picks up right where we left off, our heroes swapping appreciation for their shared defeat of the monster. Dragon might be able to catch a late flight back to Chicago, but Leonardo insists they track down whomever is behind the threatening statues, which Raph concurs, saying the cops should be protecting and serving. Finhead is clearly annoyed by this, since he did his job, stopping a living gargoyle. Did you know? Sure, it was abducting people and it tried to kill you, but was it really living? Did it ever stop to appreciate the sunset or backpack through Ireland for the summer? He drops down to the street, and a perfectly timed taxi that narrowly stops from hitting him, while it appears Raft needed to be held back from falling over, I guess trying to stop him. Look out! We're six floors up! Y'all fell about that height in the comic last week, and seem to be just fine afterwards. What, are your health bars too low? Haven't found any errant pizza boxes lying around for you to restore your energy? In a nearby alley, the uniquely costumed woman watches, posed for totally non fan y reasons, I'm sure. Since when is this city infested with superheroes? Look, just don't try hopping universes and hoping of finding one without any supers. Mephisto tried that earlier this year, and it was a waste of everyone's time. Although if she did try it and stopped the Marvel Universe first, that at least might be good for a laugh. Figuring the green-skinned freaks are going to put the kibosh on her carefully laid plans, she uses some of her magic, which she states isn't fully restored yet. The ground begins to shake, and another stone creature emerges from the street, grabbing the taxi Dragon is in. Maybe she could have saved some power if she had conjured it on a smaller panel as opposed to an entire splash page. Waste not, want not. Also, one of the freaks she decided was in her way was on his way out of town, and her plan is to stop him from leaving. Now I know what those loose straps on her arms are for. I like this. It's an idiot handle. Dragon gets the cabbie out before the car is destroyed, telling him to get to safety when the, well, dragon-like monster pins him down with its foot. The turtles drop in to help their new friend on another splash page, and while not doing a lot of damage, they do manage to tilt its balance enough that Dragon, I guess, can punch the sole of its foot, knocking it over onto some Con Ed vans, some area with a lot of high voltage given the signs. It's not really that clear, but the electricity does basically destroy the thing. An NYPD cop arrives, drawing his gun and telling Dragon to freeze, until he realizes who he is and stands down, having heard about the super cop's arrival at roll call. Finhead suggests putting out an APB, as there seems to be more than one of these gargoyle creatures, saying he clobbered two with the help of the turtles, who he finds have already split. Son of a gun! They are ninja! Ninja vanish! Shortly, the officer takes him to the 13th precinct, where we learn two more bodies were found earlier that morning. Again, senior citizens, and again the same M.O. Their duvet covers were stolen, as was every last piece of hard candy in their possession. It's downright baffling, I say! Dragon goes to meet with Captain Lowry, tolerating his flippant remarks about his appearance, his dislike of help from ringers, while accepting he's been in charge of this precinct for two decades. Did he not meet or call this guy when he came into town? Does he just try and come and go as he pleases? He's handed a file on the Gargoyle case as we go to... underground or something. 
It looks like the turtles have dropped through a hole in the ground, but it's not very clear where they are. Less so when they're surprised by a tunnel that Donatello says appears to be a natural formation. Thanks to New York City's abundance of giant earthworms, no doubt. It's actually the work of the strange wizardess, who realizes she's being followed. Though it seems it's more inadvertent than anything else, so she plans to lead the turtles to their doom. Our heroes reach a dead end, as well as a conveniently placed ladder, which is clearly suspicious, but better to fight on the street than underground. Yep, above ground, in plain sight of the public. They're ninja, you know. They end up outside the main branch of the public library, when a lion statue stirs to life, courtesy of the villainess who calls herself Virago, and intends to make them pay for destroying her creations. They're meddling that has cost her so much. Look, it's not their fault you can't write your monsters off on your taxes when you choose to create them from public land. You should have checked with your tax attorney first. At the police station, the gargoyle case file didn't really have much. No reason behind abducting old ladies, or the identity of a mysterious woman spotted at the scene. Of course, the only witness we have to her presence is some guy that walked up to her thinking she was an exotic dancer, offered her five bucks, and got punched in the face. A call comes in about the turtles fighting a lion statue at the library, and Dragon asks to be allowed to handle it, since it's why he's here, so the captain lets him deal with a crazy situation, but gives him one hour. That's all I need, he says in front of a sudden dramatic background. Was there any indication the captain wasn't going to let him do this? It's not like you were taking off the case or anything. Chill out, dude. The lion is giving the brothers some trouble, though Raphael manages to take it out with a surprisingly resilient parking meter. Time's up for you, Simba! You must avenge my death, Kimba. I mean, Simba. Virago, however, just animates the other lion statue and makes a getaway, on what may be the least necessary splash page so far. The previous one, with the gargoyle monster and the turtles engaging it in battle, at least made sense to convey the enormity of the threat. This feels like it could have been a larger panel, along two or three, maybe even four smaller ones at the bottom of the page, so it would feel less padded. Her escape, however, is cut short when Dragon appears from nowhere, taking the beast out in <laughs> And also to mistake Leonardo for Donatello. Seems like that's the end of it, right? Wrong! Because a nearby statue of Atlas stirs to life and throws the globe it's been holding. Eck! Bowling for turtles! Which also has to be Mikey's tentative name for the rock band he keeps pressuring his brothers to start with him. Donnie warns that this one seems faster than the previous statues, and when Dragon makes a snarky remark and calls him Raphael, Michelangelo corrects him. Sheesh, you guys ever consider putting your initials on your belts or something? You're impossible to tell apart! Is that racist? Yes. A little bit. No. Dragon does have kind of a point with those initialized belts, and star reporter April O'Neil got confused when she only had their masks to differentiate them. Nice going, Raphael. Only half the people on the street saw that. I'm Leonardo. Oh, sorry. I really don't know Michelangelo. I'm Raphael. Oh, sorry. I really have no idea, Leonardo. I'm Donatello. Sorry! Somehow, in between this thin little gutter, Dragon gets a hold of the statue's head and smashes it to the ground. Felt like maybe some teleporting may have been involved. That didn't buy Virago as much time as she had hoped in her monologuing that she's out of power and can now only run. She loses her cape when one of the turtles grabs her and drops down... somewhere, then warns her pursuers that they've experienced only a small portion of what she's capable of, and if they get any nearer, she'll unleash the full weight of her wrath. I'm going to ask to see your manager and make a TikTok video about this without any trace of self-awareness. I'll do it, I swear! She makes this threat while in front of the Story of Prometheus sculpture at Rockefeller Center. Who well, I guess she'd make bring the heroes fire and hope they're too distracted to chase her? But Dragon calls her bluff, not just approaching, but getting right in her face and saying not to even think about it. It's not long before she's handcuffed and put in a police wagon, swearing revenge to no one's surprise. Maybe her elderly victims were somehow the key to her abilities, but Dragon is more concerned with making his report and heading home. Have you tried splitting up and looking for clues? It always works for us. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure it does, Cupcake. Weird, since when he thought there was just one stone creature killing people, he was fine with busting it and leaving ASAP. 
now he's all about the protocol. Officer Kelly, the cop he met earlier, says that even the captain will have to admit what a good job he did, but Finhead admits he can't take all the credit, as the comic ends with his admission of getting help from some locals, as the turtles watch from nearby. That was Savage Dragon slash Ninja Turtles, and it was... okay, but not great. A little weird for a story in an ongoing to continue in a different publisher's crossover one-shot, especially when there was no advertising for it, and it started with no indication or notation of preceding events from Savage Dragon number 2, so someone picking this up first would likely be confused. They also don't really get into Virago's plans, only hinting about why she may have picked victims of a certain age, which could make this story feel for some a little unfinished. Okay, she's evil, she needs to be stopped, and sometimes a few of these details can be omitted and still leave you with a good enough story. But between the odd specificity of the victims and statements of carefully laid plans, it does feel just a bit unsatisfying, leaving questions with no answers. Unless you pick up Dragon's ongoing, I assume, and wait for her next appearance, and perhaps some exposition that references these events, if only just to put them in greater context. Much of the focus seems to be the heroes reacting to the monster's appearances, with no real indication of any kind of investigation. At least none that we see. Heck, the turtles seem to basically stumble onto Virago's trail by chance. Kind of an unrelated side note, much to my surprise, Virago wasn't flagged by my spell check. It's an actual word, synonymous with woman or Amazon. Also shrew, which is either meant as the pejorative, or it explains her hairstyle. Like maybe she has a nest of actual shrews living up there or something. Dragon seems more or less the same here as he did last week. A little rough around the edges, but knows when to hold back. Even against a superior officer that mocks him for the way he looks. I find your petty racism very entertaining. He didn't seem to believe in magic last week, but here he kind of just passively acknowledges it, and it's not really given much attention at all. Could just be an oversight on the writer's part, or maybe they didn't think it was a big enough deal to address. The Turtles do get to display a bit more individual personality, but only a bit. Donnie is shown to be analytical, noticing the tunnel seems more natural, and how things didn't seem quite right when they arrived outside the library. Leo was more commanding, a time or two, and Raph seemed rather excited at the prospect of finding danger at the end of the tunnel. Mikey? Yeah, he cracked a couple of jokes. So did Raph. But sometimes his snark didn't make any sense. Like saying, in your face, a comment usually used when you've one-upped someone, in a situation where there was no one-upping, and seeming to go a tad meta with how absurd things were getting, fighting the scantily clad sorceress bringing statues to life. What I think is absurd is the talking martial arts turtle, whose dad is a rat and they just made pals with a green bodybuilder with a built-in fan on his skull, thinking the magic lady is absurd. Was he referring to their specific situation, despite that they know magic exists, or that they seem to be stuck on the back foot, or what? They also can appear to be a little low-key in their role. They do fight the stone monsters, but most of them are beaten by Dragon once he gets in one good punch. Almost like they didn't need to be there. But they do contribute, helping the cop when he's pinned, and finding the culprit, even if luck seemed to be involved. With almost half of the first ten pages of this story being splashes, and at least one, maybe two of those five instances being moments that maybe didn't need that much space, it can feel rather padded. The pacing isn't really helped by a lack of establishing shots in a few places to know where they are, or more vague backgrounds telling us what's happening. If they'd cut back on some of the big dramatic panels, and maybe one splash page, then maybe there'd be more breathing room and make scenes make more sense and less jarring, when it seems they just suddenly end up at Rockefeller Center. Or how the turtles seem to drop into the sewers when they found the tunnel, but that entryway they used looks like it was a hole caused by damage to the ground, unlike the actual manhole they emerged from outside the library. All the jumping around so quickly gives an unfocused vibe. This happens, then that happens, then this happens, then a thing happens, and then another thing happens! Woo! I do like how the art has thinner line work, and the color tones are a bit different, seeming a little lighter. It doesn't seem less violent or graphic than last week's book, though there's more action to be had. Virago's appearance is more frequent, so given her costume, there's more cheesecake. 
and we do get some mild cursing. So, while compared to Savage Dragon No. 2, it looks on the surface a lighter tone, but it's really not. So, not exactly something I would recommend for very young kids. It feels unpolished in some areas, a few discrepancies that could have been cleared up or fixed that I think would make for a stronger, more coherent story. That and I think it could have indicated that it's technically a part two, or they just could have put both parts in one book, and that would have helped a lot. It's not awful, just not as good as I think it could have been. Though not offensively so, since there is some fun to be had. I'm the Angry Spork, and man, have I got issues. Mm -hmm.